So here we're creating the same cat struct we've created many times, and we're defining two methods for cat. And the way you define methods is it looks like a function definition, but you put the so-called receiver of the method first in its own pair of parens before the method name. So this is defining a method sleep where the receiver is of type cat, and inside the method we'll refer to the receiver as C, though we're not actually using it in this particular method, but we could. And then all the other parameters you put inside the parens after the name of the method. But in this case, we don't have any, so we just leave that empty. And the sleep method is just simply printing out z, 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 z. And this method eat also has a receiver of type cat, which we'll, we'll call C. And it has another parameter, food, which is a float32, and it's returning a float32. And when we call the eat method on a cat, the method receives a copy of the cat in C, and we're going to access the weight of that copy, add food to it, and that's the value returned. So down here in main, we're using the colon equal syntax to declare a variable C, and the type is implicit from what we assigned to it, and because we're assigning a cat value to C here, the compiler knows that this is a cat variable. And here we're calling the method sleep on C. This C is passed to C of sleep. It gets a copy of the same cat. Be clear, C here in main and C in the, the methods are totally unrelated. They just happen to have the same name. And this method call to sleep will simply just print out Z, 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 Z. And here we're calling the eat method on C, passing in also the float value 0 0.3. So C of main gets copied to C of the eat method and the 0 0.3 gets copied to food. And we take the weight value of this C in the eat method and add food to it. And that's what we return. So this should be 15.2 plus 0 0.3, that gives us 15.5 and that's what this returns. Down here, when we use the reference operator on a cat variable, what we get back is a pointer to cat. So that's what the type of P is. It's gonna be a variable which is a pointer to cat. And given a pointer to cat, we can get back the cat it points to using the dereference operator, and then we could call the sleep method on that cat. And so that's actually what the syntax is doing. The asterisk, the dereference operator has a lower precedence than the dot, so we need the parentheses here to make sure the dereference is done first, and then we are calling uh, the method sleep on the cat value returned by this expression. But the Go compiler, as a convenience, uh, we don't have to actually explicitly dereference. It'll just automatically do that for us. So we can just write p.sleep, and the compiler will implicitly uh, do this. It'll dereference p, get the cat value, and then call sleep on that cat value, which we got from dereferencing. And same thing down here when we call eat. Uh, we could explicitly dereference, but we don't normally do so in Go because the compiler will do it for us. And this is also true if we want to access the fields, not just methods. Like say we want to create a variable z here, which is an int variable, and assign the uh, age of the cat in p. So we could do uh, dereference p dot age, and that's getting the cat value pointed to, getting this age, and assigning that to new int variable z. But we don't have to actually explicitly dereference. We can just write this, and the compiler will implicitly do the dereference. Same if we assign to a dereference. So we could explicitly write uh, p dot age equals nine, but we don't have to explicitly do the dereference. If we just left it like this, the compiler would do the dereference implicitly. Again, be clear, strictly speaking, a pointer to a cat is not something that actually has its own fields or methods, but the compiler knows that and says, okay, you must mean to dereference. And so it'll do the dereference for you implicitly. The receiver of a method not only can be a struct type, it can also be a pointer to struct type. So here again, we have the, the same cat struct we just defined, the same sleep method, but now the eat method is defined to have a receiver of not type cat, but pointer to cat. And so when eat is called, it's called not on a regular cat, but on a pointer to cat. And the rule is that a struct and a pointer to that struct share the same set of methods. So having defined sleep on cat, I can't define a sleep method for pointer to cat. And having defined eat for pointer to cat, I can't define a method on regular cat. So if I tried to write C cat eat, and it wouldn't matter what else the signature is, like it could be the same parameters or different. So I've just made like uh, a int, and this returns a string or something totally different. Uh, regardless, because we already have eat defined on pointer to cat, we can't also have eat defined for regular cat. So the compiler would object to having both of those. We can only have one. And the reason for this will be evident when we look down here in main. Uh, we're creating the same variable c, which is a cat, and we're calling the sleep method just like we did before. Everything's same so far. But now when we call c.eat, this is valid, 
But the eat method is not expecting a regular cat, it, it wants a pointer to cat. So implicitly what the compiler is doing for us is we could write this explicitly, but it just does this for us implicitly if we write c.eat. It gets a pointer to c, and that is what we're calling the eat method on. And oops, there should actually, of course, be the argument 0 0.3 in there. And same down here. Now that's correct. Yes, this is just shorthand for this over here. The compiler knows this is not a pointer, and it knows that only pointed to cat has an eat method, not cat itself. So it knows that we need to get a reference to C implicitly. And down here, we're again creating a variable P, which is a pointer to cat, which is holding a reference to the C variable. And if we call p.sleep, well, again, like before, the compiler knows to implicitly dereference P, because P is not a regular cat, it's a pointer to cat. It knows you need to dereference first, and then it can call the method sleep. But then down here, when we call p.eat, P is a pointer to cat, and that's what the eat method is expecting as its receiver. So so the value of p is simply copied to c directly with no dereference or, or reference. And inside the eat method, we've changed things a little bit. Uh, here, when we access c.wait, c is a pointer to cat, and of course, pointers to cats don't really have their own fields. This is implicitly dereferencing c and then accessing the wait field of that. And this assignment, we're, we're taking the current value of wait and incrementing it by food. Because the c here in eat is now effectively a pointer to this variable c from main, this assignment is modifying the cat value stored in c. What was 15.2 here in c is now 15.5. Anyway, having modified c.wait, when we then access it here in the return statement, it's now 15.5, and that's what's returned from the method call. And then back in main here, after the call to eat, when we access p.wait, or in fact, if we were to access c.wait, it would be the same thing, because p points to c we get the value 15.5 because the method call has effectively modified the cat that was passed in. That's one reason why you would want the receiver to be a pointer rather than the cat type itself. Because when we receive a pointer, we can modify the thing passed in. If we just had a regular cat, we wouldn't be modifying cat back in main. We'd just be modifying the local cat inside the eat method and the change wouldn't be seen outside the method. The reason we're not allowed to have a method of a particular name, like say eat, defined for both cat and pointer to cat, well, it wouldn't create an ambiguity for the compiler, but it would create scenarios where you, you may end up uh, accidentally changing how a method behaves because of this implicit behavior where if you call a method on a pointer, it'll automatically dereference, or vice versa, if you call a method on a non-pointer, if necessary, it'll get a reference to the thing if the method is expecting a pointer. Like imagine here, if I could come and add a method on regular cat of eat, and I'll just give it the same signature, And now we just do something in there. And now down here, when we call um, c.eat, well, before it was implicitly getting a reference to c and calling this version, but then if, if this were allowed, you would expect this call to be calling this one instead. So there'd be a potential for creating new methods w which would change what gets called from existing calls in a way that could be very unexpected and create problems. So. So because of this allowance, this convenience of automatically re uh, referencing and dereferencing when we call methods, you wouldn't want to have uh, methods defined for both cat and pointer to cat at the same time. It, it would create accidents. So if we can define methods on pointer types, can those pointer types then also implement interfaces? And the answer is yes. And the rule governing this is a little strange. The rule is that if you implement for an interface, all of the methods of that interface for some type T, for the non-pointer type, then automatically both T and pointer to T are considered to implement the interface. But this doesn't go both ways. If you implement all of the methods of an interface on some pointer type T, then only pointer type T implements the interface, not regular T. And in fact, if you implement all the methods of an interface, some on T and some on pointer to T, as, as soon as just one of them is implemented for pointer to T rather than T, then only pointer to T will implement the interface. So here, a concrete example, if we have this interface animal with three methods, eat, sleep, and drink, and our type cat, uh, regular cat, non-pointer cat, is implementing all of the methods, then not only does cat implement the interface, but also pointer to cat will implement the interface animal. And so down here in main, if I create a variable of type animal, I can create a variable of type A and assign a cat to it, but I can also assign pointers to cat to it, and that's also okay, because both cat and pointer to cat implement the interface. However, as soon as any one of these like say sleep here, if I make it uh, have a receiver of pointer to cat instead of regular cat, well now only pointer to cat implements the interface and this here would be a compile error. We had regular cat we couldn't assign to A because it wouldn't be considered to implement the animal interface. 
very strangely. This doesn't affect what happens when given a cat or pointed a cat when we call these methods. Uh, having defined all these methods, we can call any one of them on a cat or pointed a cat, and the Go compiler will, as appropriate, either reference or dereference the thing as needed to, to call the method for the, the cat or pointed a cat. But it's a separate question of whether cat and or pointed to cat implement the interface. And so as soon as any one of the methods is implemented on pointer to cat rather than the cat, it could just be one, it could be two of them, could be all of them, well then only pointer to cat implements the interface. And remember the rule, having defined a method eat on pointer to cat, we can't also define it on cat or vice versa. Given a particular method name, it can only be implemented on either cat or pointer to cat, not both. So the only way to implement a method on a non-pointed type is to have all of the methods implemented on the non-pointed type. And this is the only way that cat will implement the interface. But effectively, whenever cat implements the interface, then pointed cat will also always implement the interface. Why this asymmetry? Why does it not work both ways? Uh, the answer for that is quite archaic. If the rule did work both ways, it would create scenarios where you might do certain things on accident. It's a, it's a very archaic scenario. But that's why the rules are this way, to avoid those strange accidents. So now the question is, does this imply that you should always implement your methods on the non-pointer type so they're conveniently both the pointer and non-pointer type would implement the interface because that's the only way to have both? And the answer is, well, sometimes that's useful, but sometimes it isn't. And the trade-off is that um, sometimes you want your methods to have pointer receivers because you don't want to pass the full thing. Keep in mind, with non-pointer parameters to a function or, or non-pointer receivers for methods, the thing itself is being copied in full. And imagine you had some struct type that was very large. Um, you may not necessarily want to pay the cost of, of copying that thing in full every time you call the method. And so in those cases, you would probably want to have a pointer receiver rather than a non-pointer receiver. So I think what most Go programmers do is just on a case-by-case -case basis, they just uh, decide whether a method should have a pointer receiver or a non-pointer receiver, and they don't really think about the implication of which implements the interface. Because when in doubt, well, at least the pointer type will implement the interface, right? So even though you have to have all non-pointer receivers to implement an interface for both T and pointer to T, I wouldn't really let that stop you from implementing methods with pointer receivers. Sometimes you just need a pointer receiver. Not only can we implement methods on structs and pointer to structs, but we can also implement methods on named types and pointers to named types. And yes, that means that a name type and a pointer to a name type can implement interfaces, and the rules are exactly the same. So here, for example, we have some named type called time, which is defined as a float64, and so we can have a method fly where the receiver is of type time, and a method kill where the receiver is a pointer to time, and both are valid methods. We couldn't, though, have a method defined on float64 itself. Even though time and float64 are really the same thing, the compiler just will not allow it. It only allows us to find methods on named types and structs, not for any other thing. I think the rationale for that is that, well, the built-in types are used in all parts of code. So like you have your program and you're bringing in a bunch of packages that other people have written to make up your one program. And if we could give methods to built-in types in one package, then that, that in a sense would be like redefining this thing used in other packages in a way that could be kind of strange and unexpected. Named types, however, are things that we ourselves are defining. And oh yes, there's one very important rule I haven't mentioned. When you define methods on a type, you can only do so in the package where that type is defined. So when you define a struct or you define a named type, all the methods you define for that type have to be defined in the same package. Recall that an interface value, what it actually represents is a reference to some concrete value of some implementer of the interface and also a reference to the type of that value. So say for example, if we have an animal interface and it's implemented by both dog and cat, well, if I create an animal variable, I can assign to it dogs or cats, both are acceptable, and say I assign it a dog, what that variable is going to store is a reference to the dog value and also a reference to the dog type. And so what we will want to do sometimes with interface values is get at the concrete value which it references and get it as its type. To do so, we use a type switch, and here's the syntax we had in GoPigeon, where here's a function foo, has a single parameter f of type fruit, where fruit is an interface, uh, implemented by both banana, orange, and perhaps some other types as well. And so to switch over this interface value, write type switch, an expression which gives us an interface value here, and then we have cases for the different possibilities of what it might be. It might be a banana, it might be an orange, or it might be something else. 
And we don't have to have default, that's optional, but if it's there, it's at the end. We don't have to have either banana or orange, we can leave them out. So we can just choose which cases we care about. But what happens is that in the case that this fruit value here is referencing a banana, then the banana case runs, and in that banana case, we access the banana value as B. It's stored in this variable B that exists only in this body. But then in the case it's not a banana and instead an orange, then this orange case runs, and the value is stored in this variable O. And if it's not a banana or an orange, if none of the cases match, then the default is executed. And if we want to access the, the value, well, we have it as the fruit value F, so we just use that instead. The equivalent in Go is written with the word switch, not type switch. And then you have, here's the interface value, just some expression that gets us back an interface value, in this case a fruit. Then you write dot, and then in parens you have the reserved word type. It is a reserved word, I don't know why it's not highlighted here. The hi editor should be highlighting it, but it's not. Uh, and then you have colon equals with a variable which you're assigning that value to. And then you have the different cases. Notice there's no variable name here, just have the type names. And in the banana case, if you want to access the banana, it will be available as the variable x. And in the orange case, if you want to access the orange, it'll be available as x. And in the default case, if you want to access the original uh, interface value, it's available as x. So x is present in all of these different cases and the default. But the strange thing is that it has the different type in the different cases and the default. In, in the banana case, it'll be a banana. In the orange case, it'll be an orange. And in the, in the default case, it'll be the original interface type, in this case, fruit. Sometimes given an interface value, we just want to test if it's one specific type, not multiple types. And so in that case, it's generally more convenient to use what's called a type assertion rather than a type switch. And a type assertion is an operation where you have your interface value and then you write dot and then in parens, you put the concrete type name you want to assert which this thing is. And what we get back is two values. We get back, in this case, because we're asserting that, that F here, this fruit value is a banana, we get back a banana value, but we also always get back a Boolean. And that Boolean will be true if this interface value actually is a banana, if it's referencing a banana. Otherwise, if it's referencing some other type, like say an orange or a mango or something, then uh, OK will be false. And regardless whether the interface value is actually referencing a banana, it could be something else, it could be an orange, it could be something totally different. Uh, but regardless, we always get back a banana value, which is being assigned to B here. And of course, in the event that F is storing a banana, then we get back a copy of that banana value, the value which F is referencing. But in the event it's something else, what we get back for this banana value here will be the default value, the so-called zero value of the banana type. And so what we wanna do generally after performing a type assertion is you wanna look at the Boolean and branch accordingly of like, okay, it was a banana, and so now we can use B as a banana. And so in here, the value of B will be useful Whereas otherwise, in this else clause, the value of B is simply just the zero value for banana and not really useful. So you'll want to branch accordingly after doing type assertions. And of course, we can use the convenient colon equals syntax here. We just use colon equals and we wouldn't have to explicitly declare these variables. In fact, if, if, if I left these variable declarations here, the compiler would complain that we're redeclaring B and OK and it wouldn't like that. So you'd want to get rid of these after using colon equals syntax. Now, sometimes when you do a type assertion, you might in a certain context be very confident that a particular interface value is referencing a value of a particular type. You might be really confident that this fruit value F here uh, is really always going to be a banana because you've arranged it in your code that that's, that's how the logic works. Every time foo is called, the fruit value passed in is always banana. That'd be a strange thing to do. You might as well then just make the parameter banana, but just go along with the scenario here. So in those cases where you're absolutely confident that it's going to be a specific type, then you can use a so-called single value context form where we're not returning two values, we're just returning one. And so there's only one target of assignment here, just the banana, there's no Boolean. Be careful about this though, because what will happen if F is not actually banana in this single context form rather than the multi-value context form, when this type assertion is performed at runtime, if this F here is not a banana, then you get a panic, you get a runtime error. And generally then that means your code will abort. So be careful only to use this uh, single value context form of a type assertion in context where you're very, very confident that it's going to be that specific type and always going to be that specific type. If it's ever in doubt, then you should use the multi-value context form, the form that also returns a Boolean, like here.